Tonight would be our seventh lesson for those following along sequentially, studies in Galatians, a little journey through Paul's epistle to the church at Galatia. Actually, let me rephrase that, an epistle to the churches of Galatia. Uh, for what that's worth, there were obviously several churches in a large region, and Paul's writing to them about the what he considers a tragedy. Um, somebody has come in and for lack of, well, to use a Jesus phrase, they've sown tares among the wheat. They've, they've started ministering, preaching, teaching. Um, Paul, Paul will eventually get around to pretty much telling us what the false doctrine is as, we, as he starts to introduce the interspersing of law back into the message of grace. But to get us there, Paul does a lot of bio work, and we're going to try and conclude this portion of the bio section of Paul tonight. I have not been trying to drag this part out. I've just been trying to glean what things that I can in the bio that have relevance to our journey, to our spiritual journey, because we all have a bio. <laughs> we all have a story, and our stories are not the same, although we're all in the same room for a moment. And in a way, then, our stories do cross. And so what we... I'm fond of saying you bring your whole life into a room. Um, I know what that sounds like, I mean, is you, 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 your real self shows up, but that's not really it, because that's not true at all. We don't all show our real self, but we do bring our whole experience into a room. And so we bring our whole experience into the journey. And that's what makes this fun and unique, and that's why the church is important, and that we're not solo artists. So when we look at Paul's bio, we get to look at our bio. And so as you see how Paul transformed, you get to look at your own transformation and you get to have permission, I guess is a good way to say it, to realize that you don't have it all figured out and that you've changed your mind a few times and that maybe you'll do that again. That's probably a good thing. And that you're allowed to grow in this journey. And I think we've already pointed out a few times where I think Paul grows. And we're going to see a spot tonight where perhaps we see a Paul who would say something different in another part of his life. That's fine too. Um, the reason that I say this is closing the bio section, um, this is our seventh lesson. We will not finish the second chapter tonight, but we'll come really close. And one of the things that I, reason I don't want to finish it is because the true deep theology of Galatians, we haven't even touched yet. Paul really kind of takes his time more than any of his other letters to get to it. There's almost two whole chapters of what he had come out of, his confrontations, his ideas about ministry. At the end of chapter two, we get into the deep theological waters that never really stop. They, they take us through three, four, five, and six. And so we'll slow way down when we get there because that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to mine out the stuff from the theology parts. It's fun to talk about his bio. It's fun to look at his past. But at the end of the day, what we're really here to do is learn about the Christ that Paul claims that he sees and then spends his life, gives his life in defense of. And we really get into that um, in the next several lessons. And, and when we do, and we're going to start a little bit of it tonight because it, it's kind of eases in in this portion. Uh, and when we do, get ready to slow down and get ready to take a run into some of his other epistles because Paul, we're going to use it as sort of a way to cross-reference what Paul has to say. Tonight our title is The Truth of the Gospel. This is not an attempt for me to tell you what is the actual gospel versus what is not the gospel. That's not what this title means. I borrowed this straight from the New King James Version of one of our verses tonight where Paul claims that um, the truth of the gospel was not being presented properly. And then I think he spends the rest of Galatians trying to lay out what he thinks that is. So I'm not going to try to do that in one lesson. Or I don't even, I'm not, hopefully not pretentious enough to think I know the truth of the gospel. Um, Jesus is the truth. I know a lot of things that are true, but Jesus is the truth. And at the end of the day, the gospel is about Jesus. And it's, and it's only it's at its best whenever we keep it as close as we can to just being Jesus, who he is, what he does. And to me, that's the truth. And all the other stuff can sort of get in the way. So I want to just say up front, for those who click their sort of titles or bait for people, this isn't about exposing what I think is the false gospel. It's not about going after ministries and ideas and theologies and going, watch out for that and that and that. We're going to try to confine it to where Paul is. And, and, and that's enough because Paul goes... He goes pretty deep. I do want to start with a verse that we ended with last week because I, as the weeks go on and I look back on what we did, sometimes I go, gosh, we didn't really do that justice. And so I feel a little bit better if we would start a little bit before where I want to, or where, where, where the actual chronology demands that we do tonight. 
I want to start with this statement, and we don't always start with a statement. Often I start with scripture, but I want to start with a statement and then let a verse kind of inform this statement. The object of affection in both, and I all caps both, because I want us to put both the Old and the New Covenant together with this thought. The object of affection in both of those is the other. And I capitalize the O for my own purposes because I want to use it as a, as a noun. I want it to be a group of people, not just the other person over there, but the whole group of other. And some of those are the poor. I'm not trying to say this is the only thing the other is, but it's never not this. The poor, the widow, the orphan, the stranger, and the neighbor. And the reason I say the object of affection is because the Old Covenant and the New Covenant actually has all of these people in mind. Whenever you read the terms of the Old Covenant, when you read what God's telling Israel to do, it's in protection of the poor, the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the immigrant, the, the transient, um, the minority, the crushed, the outsider, the leper, the sinner. The, it's, the, it's to watch out for them. You're never allowed to run over them. You're never allowed to abandon them. You're never allowed to make it all about us and, and being strong at the expense of stepping on the other, forgetting the other, ignoring the other. Leaving the, the old covenant does not allow that. We might, we, we might say a lot of things about the old covenant and the law and go, well, we, that's not for our righteousness. And we're right. But there are, the object of their affection was the other. For instance, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Why? The other matters. It matters that you don't break up someone else's union. It matters that you don't steal their property. It matters that you don't take their life from them because they're important. And, and I know we're fond of saying, well, you didn't even need faith to obey that. We're right. You didn't need faith because it wasn't about your faith. It was about you not killing someone. <laughs> it was about you not stealing their stuff. It wasn't about faith. And, and that's an important point. And, we're gonna, and that we need that point for tonight. But the object of affection in the new covenant is also the other. It's love God and love your neighbor as yourself. It's love as I've loved you. It's it's Jesus taking up the argument in his era of who's my neighbor because that's troublesome. This surely isn't about loving my neighbor. You came all the way down here. You, this is your incarnation? Is it telling me to love my neighbor? And at the end of the day, yes. And the new covenant is never less than loving your neighbor. It's never less than the other. And so I wanted to start there so that you see both the old and the new aiming at the same thing, the other person. And how they, their place in the world. Why do we say that? Well, because this is the verse that we ended with last week. But I want to start with tonight. It's this 10th verse of chapter 2. And this is Paul talking about Peter and James and John. They desired only that we, that's who they is, Peter, James, and John. They desired only that we, we as Paul and Barnabas and Titus, at least, from our discussion from last week, they just wanted us to remember the poor. That's the very thing I was eager to do. And last week, we just sort of left that out there. We read it, and we, we didn't do much with it. So I thought it was a good place to launch tonight with the idea that they want Paul to maintain what the aim was. Jew, good Jewish guy. You want to honor our Jewish roots. How do we do that? Aim at taking care of the poor. Paul's over here trying to preach a new covenant. And this was this book's about to shift from old covenant to new covenant. And yet, Paul goes, well, I actually want to do that. And, and he never tries to pull the new covenant into something else. You know, like, no, nah, it's not about. And that's where we got to be really careful. When our version of the new covenant loses that aim, and that is so easy to, for that to happen because we get individualistic. In, in the new covenant. And, and that can turn us from that aim. And Paul, so it's, it's kind of Paul kicking this whole thing off with, that's all I really wanted to do is take care of the other. But I'm just going to introduce to you a better message of taking care of them, a better way of taking care of them. And so that for me is how Paul launches. And I'd never seen it that way before. To me, that's how Paul launches his argument in the new covenant was, no, we're not going to abandon what the old covenant told us to do, which is love our neighbor. We're just going to show you a better way to live in that. And let me give you a, 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 something to think about that really isn't going to matter as much tonight as it will when we get to, say, chapter 5. But, and that's months away, I know. But it's the kind of thing that I want to stir, to kind of stir in your soul for a little while, okay? 
And this is the kind of thing that we'll come back to time and again. The law became an idol within the old covenant. And performance, and after I had typed this out, I thought, I can do better than performance, but I don't want to lose it. So I, parenthetically, we insert the word works. So say that however you want. The law became an idol within the old covenant and works became the worship of that idol. This was the fault with that system. Before I read the next line, remember Hebrews 8 said there was a fault with the old covenant. It said, had there not been a fault with it, a new one would not have been offered. So as far as I can see, one of the faults of the old covenant is that law became the idol of the covenant. It became the thing that you worshiped in the midst of that old covenant was the doing good versus the doing of evil. And then your works became how well you were doing it. Works became the expression of your worship. I hope you can see that we've kind of done that even to this day, right? Works has become an expression of worship. And maybe that's because we've conflated covenants. That's a problem. But look at the second one. Liberty can easily become the idol of the new covenant where self becomes the mode of worship. I hope you can see what I'm doing. I think the law is what we start to focus on in the old covenant and that's the problem because we focus so much on the law, we make it out to be the covenant and then our works determines whether or not we're doing a good job and we've lost our way. But liberty can become the idol of the new covenant and it sounds like this, I'm supposed to be free and I don't care what anybody thinks about it and I don't care who it hurts and, and self, excitement, pleasure, peace becomes the entire motivating purpose behind the new covenant, then liberty becomes the idol. Individual liberty becomes the idol in the midst of the new covenant. And in both cases, the other from our last statement, the poor, the stranger, the widow, the outsider, the other doesn't matter anymore. They cease to be important because if the law is what's most important about the old covenant, then it's my doing of stuff that matters. Even if I forget why I'm doing it. And if liberty's all that matters, then the other person doesn't matter near as much as I do. Okay. And so the others start to be pressed to the side. And then once they cease to be important, then we really need to check our faith. Because I think we should always be in a process of checking our faith because our faith needs to really line up with how we treat our neighbor. And, and if it isn't, then we got to reevaluate our faith. Whether we're legalists or new covenant people. Um, I don't want to be a legalist, but I also don't want to be the kind of new covenant person that thinks liberty is the highest form of honoring the new covenant. That my individual liberty is the highest form at the expense of stepping on whoever I have to because it doesn't really matter what people, who they are, what they think. Now that leads us into tonight's bio section. One more little section where Paul's going to talk about a confrontation that he has with Peter. There's some interchangeable language depending on your translation. Those of you watching at home and those of you in this room, depending on the translation that you use, NRSV, NIV, New King James, you're going to have differences in Kepha, some say Cephas, and in Peter. And it depends on the translation. They're the same person. Paul kind of uses them interchangeably at times. Also, oddly, the translators use them interchangeably. They'll be the same word in the Greek. Sometimes they'll say Kepha, sometimes they'll say Peter for kind of reasons unknown. So, um, just want to let you know that so that when you read it, depending on your translation, you'll realize that this is who Paul's talking about. So I'm just going to call him Peter. Paul and Peter are about to have a confrontation. Uh, I want to set it up because what is our Galatian study if you don't get one verse from the book of Acts? <laughs> really incomplete. Um, you wouldn't feel like anything was done. So let's add, let's put two of them back to back. Acts 15.35 and Galatians 2.11 because this is our next verse right here. It's Galatians 2.11. But I want to show you where this happens. Remember, Acts 15 is the council in Jerusalem. At the end of it, Paul and Barnabas... Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Who are the many others? Galatians 2.11, when Peter had come to Antioch, I was stood into his face because he was to be blamed. And so it looks very much like where we take off in Galatians 2 is where the council in Jerusalem has just dismissed in Acts 15. Paul and Barnabas, along with Titus, leave that, go back out to Antioch. They begin to preach the gospel. Paul's preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter shows up fresh off the heels of the council in Jerusalem. And Paul then says this in Acts chapter 2, verse 12. Here's the story. I'm sorry, Galatians 2, 12, not Acts. I'm so into Acts. 
Galatians 2.12. Is that our next one? Uh, oh, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Here's the next verse after that I was studying to his face. Bef before certain men came from James, he, Peter, Peter would eat with the Gentiles. But when those men came, he withdrew and he separated himself because he feared those who were of the circumcision. I'll try to explain this in my language here in a second. The rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. That's, that's bold language by Paul. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We'll pause here for a moment. Most of you know this story, but I was aware that we're not all in the same spot. In, in understanding these stories or having heard them. So in a nutshell, here's the Paul White version of this. Paul and Peter are getting along pretty good. They just had a pretty good council together in Jerusalem in Acts 15. And they're having their sort of early moments of Peter's accepting that Paul's here to preach to Gentiles. Paul's pretty much aware Peter's here to preach to the Jews. It's kind of a, we're going to go our separate ways. I'm going to do my thing and you're going to do your thing. But we're both going to preach Jesus. We're both preaching Christ crucified. So everybody's real good. James sends a contingency. James is the de facto leader of the early church. This is the brother of Jesus. And considered the head, for all intents and purposes, of the movement that is still largely Jewish coming out of Jerusalem. James is at the head of that. And Peter is pretty tight with him. I mean, Peter had been tight with Jesus physically, like knew him, like lived with him. And so there's a gravitas that comes with that in the early church. And there's a gravitas that comes with being near James, who is in the bloodline of the, nat of the physical Jesus. And so you have this sort of faction. And Peter's trying to get to know Paul. Paul's a different character and no doubt not at all like Peter. And maybe they're, I don't, I don't want to assume their comfort level with one another. But Peter will do whatever Paul's doing. And Paul eats with Gentiles, which you know this from your studies in Jesus, that you didn't eat with sinners. You didn't eat with Gentiles. You didn't sit down and eat with a Roman if you were a good Jewish boy. Because it was a sign of, um, we're good. And we're not good. Because we've got a heritage in the Torah that told us we don't do stuff like that. You know, we, we, we dealt with it. We did a whole book of Ruth in here coming from a, a, a point of view of, no, these people aren't allowed. And so there was some of that had still bled over into the first century. And so here's Paul eating with Gentiles because he's ministering to them. He's got his little entourage with him. And Peter seems pretty content. Here comes James's contingency from Jerusalem. And Peter dismisses himself, gets up, leaves the table of the Gentiles and will only be seen eating with his kind, his Jewish brethren. His people. This could have been racially motivated. It could have been racially visible, but it was definitely spiritually visible because the Gentiles and the Jews didn't eat the same kinds of foods. They didn't eat the same way. They didn't have the same pre-meal rituals. Here's Paul who seems perfectly content to do whatever is done at a Gentile table. Here's Peter who seems to be content until the Jews come in. And then when they come in, Peter gets up, dismisses himself, goes over and only hangs out with his own kind. Now, Paul watches this happen. He's probably sitting right next to Peter. He watches it happen and it bugs him. It, it bothers him. And he's the kind of guy that's not going to be able to keep this to himself for very long. There's, a, there, there's something about what he sees. Notice, and I said that this is pretty bold language in verse 13, but I want to concentrate on it for a minute. The rest of the Jews played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy, played the hypocrite is an interesting phrase because it's Paul who probably has the most educated classical Greek background of any mind in the New Testament and therefore probably has a good theater mind. I know that seems odd, but he would have had a well-rounded education. And in the theater, the hypocrite was a literal character on the stage. And... We don't, Jesus never says this. Jesus never says you play the hypocrite. Jesus says, you hypocrite. Which is a big difference, by the way, in saying you're a hypocrite and you're playing the hypocrite. To play the hypocrite, the hypocrite was a role in which, and most actors had to play the hypocrite at some point because casts weren't large enough 
and there were no women in theater. So a man would have to put a mask on or an entirely different costume in order to play a second character within the same show. The Greek word for that was the hypocrite. That's your secondary character. It's not your main character. And so it gets kind of co-opted in religious language as being, you're not being the real you. Like you're a person, but then you're the hypocrite means, now when Jesus says you are a hypocrite, that's like saying you've forgotten who your first person is and you're only living out of this fake you. Okay. Paul says you played the hypocrite, which is sort of Paul's way of going, you know better. Like, you know who the real you is. I just saw him sitting here eating with Gentiles and you laughed at their jokes and you thought they were great. And then you played the hypocrite. You stuck a mask on. It's not the real you so that you could blend in with people whom you don't even really agree with because you're trying to make them happy. And this really bugs Paul, but I don't always give Paul the benefit of the doubt. I'll admit, I'm a little hard on him, but I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt here. And the reason is twofold. One is because Paul specifically says, <laughs> you, they played the hypocrite, even Barnabas got carried away with it. So Paul, it's overwhelming to do what Peter does. So overwhelming that Paul's own entourage kind of goes, I don't know, man, maybe we shouldn't be eating with these Gentiles, you know. Um, let's just go over there, it's safer, and eat with our kind. And Paul, ugh, he can't take it, it infuriates him. But I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt for another reason. 14, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth, then I said to Peter, okay, don't even worry about what he says to Peter, just pay attention to when he said it. So when Peter gets up and goes to the other table, Paul keeps his mouth shut. He don't like it. He thinks Peter's playing the hypocrite, but he leaves it alone. Barnabas gets up <laughs> and goes to the other table. And Paul don't like it, but he keeps his mouth shut. And maybe it's because Paul understands that kind of action. What Paul doesn't understand is 14. When I saw that they weren't straightforward about the truth of the gospel, now that did it. It's one thing to get up and go eat with them. Paul goes, I don't like it, but you know, I kind of get it. But then when you open your mouth and you preach a gospel that's different for Jews than it is for Gentiles, Paul goes, ah, okay. That's, I can't be quiet about that. And you know why I think this is a, an important lesson from Paul? is because there has to be things that we keep our mouth shut about because we don't understand them. There has to be. Otherwise, we've got to comment on everything. and <laughs> We kind of live in a world where that's the normal thing. But there also, even more important, has to be a point at which the truth of the gospel trumps everything else. At which telling people a version of the gospel that's not Jesus-centric is, a, is a bridge too far. You can do whatever you want to play the hypocrite and I'll leave you alone because I may not understand why you're doing it. I may not even understand why I'm not doing it. <laughs> and I might even do it. I want to show you in a minute, I think Paul does. It's another reason I give him the benefit of the doubt. But there's also, it also can go too far. Let me show you what I mean by I think Paul does. I don't think Paul, I think Paul leaves this alone until they pervert the truth of the gospel. As long as all they're doing is going over there and eating with Jews, Paul bites his tongue. As long as Barnabas gets up and goes and eats with Peter and the contingency from James, Paul bites his tongue. He doesn't like it, but he bites his tongue because Paul knows that he's that way a little bit too. L listen to how he says this to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I'm free from all men, that's liberty, I've made myself a servant to all men so that I might win the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those that are under the law, as if I'm under the law, that I might win those who are under the law, 21. To those who are without law, as without law, Need to explain this, not entirely without law, just without law towards God, but I'm still under the law towards Christ, or I'm still under the law of the liberty of Christ Jesus. 
so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Now, I'm not entirely sure that Paul isn't confessing. I've said this to you before. This looks like a... This has been used, by the way, against people. That we need to be everything to everybody. And the Bible never tells you to be everything to everybody. Okay? You want to talk about a way to discourage yourself, burn yourself out, put yourself under condemnation, and want, make you want to quit? Try to be everything to everybody. Try to be whatever the room needs you to be, whatever that person needs you to be, and never fail. And you will you'll be done. You won't last long. You can't, you, that's not just burning the candle at both ends. That's just sticking, throwing the candle in the fire and seeing if you can find the wick later. You won't, it's gone. You, you can't be everything to every person. I don't think Paul's bragging. I mean, I don't think Paul's giving you a command. I don't think Paul is, because he never does. Hey, be like me, be everything to all. I think it's Paul kind of going, look, I know, I morph. I can be a good Jew if it's a room full of Jews. I even know how to be a good Gentile if it's a room full of Gentiles. If you're under the law, I know how to talk like a guy under the law. If you're not under the law, I can make you think I'm not under the law. He even has to throw a parenthesis and like, don't freak out. I realize I'm still under the law of Christ, but you wouldn't know it if you saw me in that room. <laughs> kind of, if they're weak, I'm weak. And so I get it. That I, this is Paul's, I, I think it's Paul being confessional. And it's Paul telling you who he really is. And I don't think it's worth bragging about. But I also think that it's evidence, and I'm going to say, I say this carefully. I hope you understand what I mean. It's evidence that we all play the hypocrite. I didn't say we're all hypocrites. We all play the hypocrite. We all put on a mask. We all do something sometimes. It's not the real us. And it's not that that's terrible. Just don't pervert the truth when you put the mask on. You don't have to lie about the gospel when you put the mask on. And that's Paul's argument against Peter. It's not that you're eating only with Jews now and you used to eat with Gentiles. It's you've twisted the word that you said when you were just with these group of Jews and uh, Gentiles. And then when the Jewish people come in, you twist the word and, he, and Paul goes, that's something that, that I, I can't fathom. Let's, let's go back to that story from Galatians 2. When I saw, this is 14, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, and I don't know what they said, I think it probably had something to do with what they had just fought about in the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, maybe. Maybe Paul, I, I personally kind of think Paul leaves the council in Jerusalem carrying that little piece of paper that they gave him that said, don't eat meat offered to idols, don't eat things strangled, don't eat things with blood, and don't commit fornication. And I think Paul kind of shoved that in his pocket and went, I don't know, about 75% of these probably need to go. Because Paul spends much of the rest of his ministry kind of working against three out of four. Like he spends big chunks of time to the Corinthians going, I don't care if you eat meat offered to idols. I don't care if you, none of that stuff matters. Yeah, they're not real gods anyway. He does temper it with, if it offends your brother, don't eat it while the world stands. But he goes to work on those. So maybe that's part of what Paul's issue is with the truth of the gospel. Maybe he's going, hey, listen, you guys are trying to throw some things in here that don't matter. We don't really know what it is that really ticks Paul off, but we're only because we're only going to hear Paul's side of it and Paul's side sounds like this. Here's what I said to Peter. If you being a Jew live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? This is a pointed statement. This isn't just eating lunch and having some bacon. This is Paul going, you're living like a Gentile. You've abandoned the stuff that made you Jewish. Paul goes, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> you have a problem with it. But you didn't have a problem with it until they got here. And you know what? I could have left it alone until you started perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ with it. Until you started including all the performance lists and the works and all the stuff as a means of justification. That leads Paul down into his first real theological treatise of the book of Galatians, and he never stops. Also, by the way, and it depends on your translation whether or not you catch this, because translators all disagree on how to handle this. Is the rest of chapter 2 a quote from Paul to Peter? Or are the first couple of verses a quote from Paul to Peter? Depending on your Bible, your quote marks will either run for the rest of chapter 2, by the way, including the famous, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. 
And Paul's saying that to Peter. And if so, Paul goes off on Peter, like introduces the depth of the crucifixion theology. I'm crucified with Christ. I don't know. The wording is a little tricky. It kind of sounds like Paul's saying, here's what I told him. I leave that to you, just in case you're looking at different translations and trying to figure out where the quote marks go. By the way, the reason they argue is because the Greeks didn't bother to put quote marks. So we don't really know when he's talking to Peter and when he's not. We do know that at least the first line is to Peter because he says, I said to Peter, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Jesus. So does it end right there? We don't know. Um, either way, I, I will leave that. I won't bother with, with uh, working on that. Uh, whether or not it's a quote, I won't work on that too much more. So you're a Jew, you live like a Gentile. Why in the world would you try to get the Gentiles to live like a Jew? 15. We who are Jews by nature, I hope you can see what I mean. Should the quotes have ended there? Or is Paul still? Okay, that's enough. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, we. So Paul's saying, hey, Peter, you and I were born into this. We're not like the Gentiles. We know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The beginning of the great justification by faith theology of Paul starts here. But I want you to notice, he goes, look, we're natural Jews, man. We were born into this. And we know that it's all about faith. That got me to thinking. And this is actually why I put what I did up front. The law can become an idol inside of the old covenant. And the mode of worshiping that idol is your works. And that's what happened to Israel. And that's, that's what bothers Jesus when he, he's in front of the chief priests and the Pharisees. Is you, guys, you guys have made this too hard. That's what he tells them. You've made it to where nobody can get in. Because you've got a version of righteousness that's based solely on performance. And I've got a better way. And that's why the book of Hebrews says Jesus came with better promises, better covenant. However, that doesn't mean that faith isn't existent in the Old, in the Old Testament. It means that if you make law out to be a God, you'll miss faith. So if when you read the Old Testament, you're still not looking for the God that Jesus shows, you'll take the Old Testament as a book of morality. And Christians are still doing that because they're not reading the Old Testament to, for faith in Christ. If we read it for faith in Christ, it's there. It's all over the place. But if we just read it thinking that it was all about doing, then that becomes the focus of how we read it. So that got me to thinking, okay, like, for instance, what would Paul, what is Paul's theology of this? Justified by faith, not by works. So I wanted to give you one that's more familiar because that's a little clunky for us. Paul kind of runs, this is kind of why I think he's still talking to Peter because he's kind of a guy jumbling his thoughts together. He says it really well to the Romans and it's one of the most famous passages we ever have of Paul. Romans 1, 16, 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, we ought to quote 17 with it. We don't. We just quote Romans 1, 16. We kind of leave it there. The 17 is really where the money's at in this. This is where Paul really gets down to the heart of that argument. For in it, in what? In it. What's it? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Remember, this is his problem with Peter in Galatians 2, is that you messed up the gospel. So Paul goes, what's the gospel? The gospel, I'm not disappointed is another word for ashamed. I'm not disappointed with the gospel because the gospel is the power of God. All you got to do is believe. It's for the Jew first. It's also for the Greek. Why is it for the Jew first? Because it's back here. And if you think that back here is just law, you won't get that. And Because if you think that back here is just law, you'll elevate the law. Instead of elevating the other loved through faith. Okay? That's what Israel does with the law. That's why Paul comes in like a bull in a china shop going, we can't do this. This is why this is our problem is that we've elevated this. So for Paul, the gospel of Christ is how people are saved. If they'll believe it's for the Jew, but it's also for the Greek because inside of the gospel is where you'll see God's righteousness revealed, but you'll only get it from faith to faith 
For as it is written, the just shall live by faith. As it's written where? Paul only has the Old Testament. So if Paul says, as it is written, then he's using the Old Testament. The just shall live by faith sounds decidedly new covenant, doesn't it? Like, that's what we preach. How do we live? We live by faith. Where'd you get that? That's Paul. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not Paul. It's Paul reinforcing the old covenant. What gets removed in the old covenant is the old covenant for righteousness. Paul goes, it was, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that had been introduced to us through the message of the just shall live by faith. We don't live by doing the law. The law was just about the other. It was just about loving people and not stealing their stuff and not cheating on them. And, but guess what? We were prone to do that. That's how I opened this lesson. As Paul going, we were prone to take care of the poor. That's what we want to do. That's what we are. That's who we are as a people. What we are not are a people that elevate the law performance above taking care of people. And if you're going to do that, you play the hypocrite, fine. You want to play the hypocrite? I'm not going to play with you. But you want to twist the gospel? You make me out to be an enemy. For, because for Paul, the gospel is the just shall live by faith. Where'd Paul get that? Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Old Testament. It's one of the crispy books. One of those little minor prophets. Crispy because people don't read them. Pages are still stuck together 10 years after they bought their Bible. Because who wants to quote Habakkuk? They don't even, they don't even know where it is. You've got to go to the table of contents to find it. It'd be worth finding because Paul loved it. Paul goes, the just shall live by faith. But look at the opposite of it. The proud, his soul's not upright. The just lives by faith. So Paul compares the proud with the just. Right? Proverbs 3.34 he scorns the scornful. He gives grace to the humble. What's the opposite of humble? Proud. When Peter quotes this, and when James quotes this, because they both do, they say, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. And they're quoting the Old Testament. They're not making up a new statement. They're simply grabbing the old, and they're putting Jesus in it where he always belonged. Now, what makes us proud? The ability to do. We feel good about ourselves. This is the problem with the law. Because if we look at the law, not as instructions for how to take care of the other, but instead instructions for how to get God to move, then it becomes about us and it becomes about works. And then we get proud and we get haughty and we look down our nose at people because they don't do things our way. And what happens is no more grace. It's all about us. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. The just live by faith. They always did. This is why when we get there, I'm just laying the foundation. This is why Paul's working his way up to Abraham. He's going to get to Abraham and he's going to go, guys, it was always faith. God called Abraham out of the land of his fathers. He said, I'm going to give you a land to show you. All you got to do is follow me. The minute he followed him, God counted it to him for righteousness. Guess how God counts you righteous? Just follow him. The story was always Follow me. Follow me. It's the same thing Jesus says when he recruits. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And the acceptance to the great adventure offer is to follow him. Abraham does. Peter does. Let's head towards the end today. Galatians, these are the next two. This is all we're doing is... Do it a couple, move away, reinforce it, come back. Here's 17, 18. If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. By the way, just in case you wonder, the New King James really does think he's still talking to Peter. Quote Mark, top of the verse. That's why it's there. If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Paul's kind of making a transition. I, I, we're we're going to really dig into the crucified us next week. I am crucified with Christ, yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. And Paul's transition essentially um, 
if while claiming my justification in Christ, I end up being found to sin, does that mean Christ is at fault for me sinning? Well, absolutely not. But I'm not going to rebuild the thing I tore down just to keep from sinning. And that's what we do. Because we'll give people grace and they'll fail. So we'll give them some law. Because we'll go, well, <laughs> if we give them some law, they can quit failing. Paul knew better. Paul goes, you, you failed when you had law. What makes you think if you give somebody law, they're going to stop failing? He goes, why would I rebuild the thing I tore down just because I failed? This is pretty bold. Because I failed, it doesn't mean Christ is a failure. I am. But that doesn't mean I'm going to go rebuild the structure I came out of. And this could be Paul throwing a rock at Peter. And it might sound like this. This is my opinion. It could be Paul going, look. I know what you're thinking, Peter. You're sitting there eating some pig and James's boys walk in and you feel bad because you were raised not to do that. So you get up and you walk over to his table. And you know, I didn't like it when you did that, but I'll leave you alone because I'm weak like you too. But then I heard you over there telling the guys I've been winning that they need to stop eating that bacon because God demands they don't. And I know what you're doing, Peter. You feel bad about yourself. And a sense of guilt drove you right back to the law. And he goes, I'm not a sinner because I do something you believe to be wrong, even though I'm preaching justification in Christ. And you know what I'm not going to do? Rebuild dietary law so I can feel better about you and you can feel better about me. And man, you got to really buy in to preach like that. Like you got to buy in to the grace of God being the answer to land on that. And that's where Paul lands. Now it's wordy. Let's let the Amplified help us a little bit. I'm going to give you two translations. Well, one's a translation, one's a paraphrase. Okay, Amplified Bible says it this way, Galatians 2, 17 and 18. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ... Let me slow down. Amplified brackets, comments. Okay. Just in case someone's watching this and goes, what's all these brackets about? The Amplified Bible brackets the commentary based upon how the translators saw the Greek. All right. If while we seek to be justified in Christ by faith, we ourselves are found to be sinners, does that make Christ an advocate or a promoter of our sin? Well, certainly not. For if I or anyone else should rebuild through word or by practice what I once tore down the belief that observing the law is essential for salvation. I prove myself to be a transgressor for through the law, I died to the law and its demands on me because salvation is provided through the death and resurrection of Christ so that I might from now on live to God. Now I didn't do much with 19 cause we're going to let that lead us into 20 next week. Watch Eugene Peterson, the brilliant, pastoral Eugene Peterson. Oh, by the way, fun fact, when Eugene Peterson was pastoring, he was teaching a small group in his church, the book of Galatians. And he was doing a lot like we're doing, just verse by verse. And he thought it would help if I wrote it all out to them when we're finished in my words. He did. And they loved it so much. They wanted him to publish it. And they loved that so much, they wanted him to do every other book. And you have the Message Bible today because of a little class of people who liked their pastor's paraphrase, don't call it a translation, paraphrase of the way, he was a Greek genius, by the way. He was not just a fly-by-night dude who liked him some Bible and had an eloquent way of talking. He knew his Greek and had taught it and written about it for years. And so you can feather that idea in when you read his paraphrase. But paraphrase it is, but nobody does it better than the late, great Eugene Peterson. Galatians 2, 17, 18. Have some of you noticed that we're not yet perfect? No great surprise, right? And are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me who go through Christ in order to get things right with God aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin? That accusation is frivolous. If I was trying to be good, I would be rebuilding the same old barn that I tore down and I would be acting as a pretender. Good way to say that. Was there another screen on that? That's it. I thought so. I just liked that. I thought it was a good way to end. 
Can't say it better than Peterson won't try. Next week, we'll close chapter 2. We'll reread that 19th verse and lead us into 20, and 20 is just jam-packed. And it's going to cause us to have to slow down for a little bit and really get to the bottom of what Paul might have been trying to say. It's one of the beloved, and I'll, say, I'll probably say this again next week, what I think is the second greatest verse in Galatians is coming up next week. Um, so preview it by reading the last few verses of this chapter. Let's pray. Ask us ask the Lord to soak our hearts with what he's said to us tonight. And wherever it is to bring us the truth of the light of Jesus, may that be what grows. May that be what we remember. May that be what takes root. Father, tonight we've tried to talk about the truth of the gospel. We try to do it through a lens, Father, as I don't, I don't know how to spot what everybody else that does that's right or wrong. I'm just trying in my own journey to dispense of Paul White saving Paul White because it just doesn't work. And so I know that I can't read enough, do enough, pray enough, preach enough, live good enough. Wouldn't matter. And I still fail. That doesn't mean that the gospel of grace is wrong. But, but Father, I want to have the kind of determination that Paul did that even when I fail, I don't go rebuild the old version of me that was under religion so that I can feel better about my attempt. And Father, I don't think anybody watching or listening wants to do that either. So help us as we walk this out. Help us to recognize that sometimes we play the hypocrite. It doesn't mean we are one, we play one. But may we, in that we never pervert the truth of the gospel, that it is not what we do, it is what you've done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this week's program. If you would like more information, please visit our website at paulwhiteministries.com. Here you can find thousands of sermons, shop for Pastor Paul's books and series, and become either a monthly partner or a one-time donor. You can also visit our church website at midlandsgardenchurch.org. For written correspondence or to donate by check, Write us at Paul White Ministries, P.O. Box 1030, Flowery Branch, Georgia, 30542. Join us again next week here in the Garden of Grace.